Okay, I uh, just want to welcome everybody on YouTube to our first presentation of the morning for PDH Day. Um, just a quick little quick housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker this morning, uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box on YouTube and I will relay those for you. And uh, other than that, I just hope everybody enjoys. And with that, let me introduce Betty Jean Jordan, our um, executive director for GSPE. Betty Jean, go right ahead. Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for PDH Day. Uh, this is the first time we've done it virtually and uh, we've got some great speakers lined up. I hope you all have a, a very worthwhile day today. So thank you to you and thank you, of course, to all of our speakers. Uh, I sent an email to everybody, which obviously you must have gotten if you got the link for this session, but do refer to that for the speaker bios. You can learn more about our speakers there. Um, we have six sessions today. Most people have signed up for all six. They're going to be one hour each. It's possible uh, given one might run over a little bit, but we have purposely built in a, a half hour buffer between sessions to, so we can take care of other things as needed. Uh, and just want to remind you all to renew your Georgia PE license by December 31st. And other than that, I will be sending out PDH certificates early next week. And these sessions also will be available at a later date in case somebody signed up for one and could not attend today. And, and I'll send information about that later when it is um, available. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, uh, Stephanie Buckingham with Fries and Nichols. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm, I'm excited about this topic. This, this topic, passing down knowledge, has a special place in my heart. When I, when I first started at Freeze and Nichols almost 10 years ago, uh, one of my first tasks was to sit in and help with our senior leadership session. So I was, you know, I was on camera duty trying to record and capture all of the, all of the presentations, helping put the presentations together. And that is one of the ways that, that as a company, we try to focus on this passing down knowledge. And, and I feel so fortunate to have been able to kind of sit in and learn some of those stories early in my career. And now I'm kind of I'm able in my role as a trainer and coach uh, for different different pieces in the company. I'm able to also kind of weave those stories into what I do. And so I want to talk about what we're, our outline for today. I have a, a little in, introduction to help us get all on the same page as far as terms and, and things like that. I'll share some stories about what we do as a company to pass down knowledge. And, and Steve mentioned there's the comment box where you can type questions. Please feel free to use that as a, if you if your company does something that you think is really cool to share knowledge, please jump in there. I may prompt you at different times to use that as uh, in addition to questions to also share what great things that you're doing. We'll also talk a little bit about tacit versus explicit knowledge. And then we'll talk about the what, we'll talk about how and what to pass down when we're talking about this transfer of knowledge. I want to start off with a simple question. Why is this important? I'm sure you you have your own reasons for being here at the session or, or thinking about this. We always want to look at our history to see what's worked well and what we can continue. And at the same time, what didn't work and what do we need to change going forward? It's important that we are able to do this, but a lot of times we don't do it very well. I'll give you an example. And there's there's a really good podcast by Adam Grant. If you're familiar, it's, it's called Work Life. And the, the title of the podcast is called How to Remember Anything. And in, in that podcast, he's talking to someone and, and this guy shares this story that really resonated with me because uh, we do this. He said, yeah, a lot of companies, what they do, they'll for every presentation they make, it goes in a database and, and it goes in a database and maybe it's an advanced database where there's keywords and things like that. But it's what happens over time is it just becomes a dumping ground. So people put stuff in there. And then when, when someone wants to go look in that database, it's so there's so much stuff in there that it's not even helpful. The, the intent is good, but how people using it, it's not working and it just, 
it, it just becomes noise and it's not helpful. So, so that's one reason we want to avoid these kind of dumping ground type, type situations. Another thing is uh, your, the makeup of our companies are changing. Uh, at Friesen Nichols, we have about 6% of our folks right now are at retirement age and 17-ish percent will be at retirement age in the next five years. And so for us, that, that creates uh, some urgency in how we can get our hands around this and how we can do, be doing a better job of this. We think we're doing some things well, but we also know that there are some things that we really need to, to get in place so that when those people leave, their knowledge, their history, their stories, their expertise, it doesn't leave with them. And then also part of this is, um, is the cultural aspect of it. So a lot of companies pride themselves on the culture that they have, uh, whether it's uh, the innovativeness or the family orientation, the employees first. And if we're not able to capture that and, and, and instill that in the next generation of leaders, then that, that special unique things about the company culture or the organizational culture is going to leave as well. When we talk about how you can pass on knowledge, I, I've got three different, different buckets here, but I want to, I want to clarify and define how I'm thinking about them so that, so that we can all be on the same page. And coach is one of the ones, this word, when I say the word coach, people generally have all different, different definitions. So you might think of a baseball coach you had when you were a kid, or maybe an executive coach that helped you work through some different things. Uh, how I want to define it for our time today is a technical coach. Somebody, if, if you have a younger engineer who doesn't know how to do hydraulics, then the you might have a more senior engineer come do some technical coaching with them to walk them through what that looks like. A technical coach, they share their knowledge. Usually, I say it looks short term, usually it's, it's a task specific. You're working on a particular task on a project. You want this engineer to understand hydraulics on this project. And so the technical coach might sit next to them and, and talk to them through some of the different things you need to be considering and thinking about. And the coach is really a, a guide so that the younger employee, the less experienced employee can look to the guide and say, oh, okay, this, these are the things that I need to be doing for my, for my technical skills. And then the next one, the next piece is um, you can also pass it down with a mentor. This is Mentors, hopefully you have, um, hopefully you personally have a mentor or someone you can kind of reach out to. Uh, maybe your company has a formal mentoring program, which is, that's great. Those, that's a great way as a company to put some structure in place to pass down knowledge. A mentor is someone who can share their experience, shares, shares what they, some of the the speed bumps they've been been over, or um, the 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 things they didn't expect and how they handled them, they they share their experience, and a lot of times that is a that's a great way to to explain to someone what um, there's a little bit of the institutional knowledge that really comes through there through these this sharing of experience. A lot of times the mentor is looking more at a long term with the person who they're mentoring. They're they're thinking about you know, what this person's doing right now, but also what they could be doing in 10 years. And a mentor is, is for, for the way that, that we're going to define it, it's more of a model, someone who they can guide, but it also, but it's more important is it how they are modeling behavior. And then another piece is story. So we've got your technical coaches, because you want, we want to be, we need to be passing down technical information. We have mentors who, who want to be sharing, hey, when I, um, when, when I was struggling with conflict management, this is how, here are some of the things that I use to um, get over that and, and work with other people. And then finally, stories, the stories that live inside your company. And, and I, this picture here on the screen, I love this picture, just thinking about um, all of the, the photos, you know, if you're, you're at your grandparents' house and you're going through the photos. And even if you've heard the story before, there's 
there's something special when they, they tell it again. And that's your great aunt so-and-so when they were doing this. And so the, the power of story is, can, it can be a tremendous way to, to pass on this knowledge. So it's sharing history, but also sharing a lesson. There, sometimes when we talk about history, we aren't, we give too much information. And I'll talk a little bit about this in, in a few minutes, but when we, when we share our history, we want to be really clear about what's the, what lesson did we learn there? Or maybe it's, it's a more lighthearted in nature, but what's the, what's the point? How are people going to remember that story? And I'll give you a, a couple examples. We have one of the ways that, that we transfer knowledge is not only do we have the senior leadership program that I mentioned earlier, but our senior leaders are really involved in our training program. So I, I run our new employee orientation program. We have senior leaders. It is taught by our senior leaders. I'm, I'm there facilitating and kind of help getting, making sure all the trains are running on time, but but our, our, our chairman of the board, our former CEO, he comes in and he does a history. He just shares a history. Our company has been around for 126 years. So we have a, a lengthy history and we want to share some of these kind of, again, like the family stories that everyone knows. And we want to kind of invite our new employees into that story. One of the stories he shares is has to do with respect and he talks about how when he was a group manager, uh, an engineer was putting spreading his stuff out over a light table and how that was the, the CAD, CAD tech kept coming in and like, how am I supposed to work with all of your stuff's here? And so our, our uh, chairman of the board, who's telling this story, will talk about how that he had a conversation with that person and say and, and asks him, what, what are you showing to this CAD tech when you put your stuff on his table? And then our, our chairman of the board will kind of look at our new employees and say, what's, what message is he sending? And, and they, they they pick up on it right away. Like that's a sign of disrespect. The engineer thinks that his, his stuff is more important than the CAD techs and the CAD tech isn't able to do his work. And, and so that's when the way that our CEO our chairman of the board tells that story it it's powerful. I remember when he told it at my orientation 10 years ago, and he continues to kind of help um, reinforce that message that we're going to respect each other here. And he does that through storytelling. He also shares stories about how in the past when our leaders were leaving the parking lot, um, we had one that was notorious for, for hitting other cars, bumping other cars when, when he was leaving. So everyone would try to leave before him so that, um, so that their car wouldn't get dinged. So he also tells fun stories. But um, when there's when you're sharing a, a story about the history, you want to make sure there's really a lesson associated with it. Obviously, when you're sharing stories, it's a look back. And then it's, a, it's about sharing, sharing this knowledge, making sure there's a point behind it. And you might be thinking, like, well, I'm not a good storyteller or our, you know, our leaders aren't great storytellers. That's a skill that can be learned. I think that with a little bit of coaching, you can get you can develop a, a really good approach to storytelling. It just takes some intentionality. And if storytelling is something you're interested in or interested in learning more about Nancy Duarte, if you're not familiar with her, she has fantastic books, TED Talks a lot of good resources about what makes stories, what makes them stick. She gives some examples of how using numbers associated with a, a humanizing story, how that's going to be more powerful than just numbers by themselves. Um, anyway, Nancy's got some, some really fantastic stuff. So I would encourage you if you're interested in, in trying to figure out how stories play a role to, to dig into some of Nancy Duarte's stuff. Now you might be thinking, what about training? Isn't, isn't training a really good way to sit down and pass on knowledge? And it certainly is. I, I, want, I want to be really clear, and that's my job is to do training, but, but I also want you to think about a time when you've learned something, like really learned something. Maybe it was a, a training event, and maybe there was something that really just really stood out to you. But more often than not, 
if, if I were to ask this in a poll, most of most people would say it was a mistake I made. I made a mistake on a project or I made a mistake doing this and I learned something. I was able to to fix it and learn the, the better way to do it next time. So a mistake, uh, a stretch assignment where I was giving something that I wasn't even sure I could, could do, but I was able to figure it out and and that helped me learn. Then, of course, you know, time with a coach or mentor. And, and then at the, the, the end of that list is a training event. And there have been studies and so uh, about this, about how what that breakdown is. Usually training is people would say that's a 10 percent versus um, a mistake or a stretch assignment that might make up 60 percent of, of a learning there. So it's not that training isn't isn't a good tool, but we don't want to think of training as the only tool to pass down knowledge. Like I mentioned, we make sure that that stories are part of of our training with our with our senior leaders. And then since I've been fortunate enough to be around our senior leaders and, and training and and uh, driving Bob Nichols around when he was still alive, I got to drive him around and do ethics training and and uh, code of conduct training for our staff. And so I'm able to pass some of those stories down during my training. I try to weave them into every every training event that I do. So training's certainly a tool, but we want to think about how we can look at other tools, other ways that we can do, we can pass down this knowledge. And so that may look like if it's a um, on the job assignment and having that technical coach and making sure that technical no coach knows that it's not just about complete getting this person to complete the task. It's also a sharing about the mistake that you made so that this this new fresh engineer doesn't make the same mistake. Or maybe it's about sharing. Yeah, this one is this project looks like this. But if it was a little bit different, this this solution over here might be a little bit better. And that time, that really intentional time is a fantastic way to to kind of pass down knowledge in those those type settings. There are there are two different kinds of knowledge when and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I do think it's helpful. It's helpful when we're thinking about what kind of knowledge to pass down and, and how we're going to do it. So the tacit knowledge, this is based on your experience. So if you've been doing engineering for 20 years, you have a lot of tacit knowledge. Um, and, and how we would pass down this is maybe the formal questions, informal discussion. This is coaching, mentoring, mentoring storytelling. These, this, is, this is things that you don't even, you may not even realize that you're passing down your tacit knowledge, but just as you're having conversations with people, you are, you're, oh, that one time on a project this happened and, and here was our solution. That's tacit knowledge and that's really important. And it's kind of a challenge right now with our remote remote world um, and our virtual world. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but but we're sometimes we're not having those the same informal discussions. The tacit knowledge is super important as we're, we're passing down knowledge, how we can pass down that tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is also important. This is, this is the, the presentation database. How are we documenting our processes? How are, we, are our procedures documented? How is our knowledge of our clients or our um, our organization, how are we, what's documented? What do we have that you could pick up a piece of paper and actually read about about this project or, or whatever? Hey, Stephanie? Yes. We have a question from Wonderful. Uh, Ryan Gilbert. Uh, says, an aging workforce is a big concern in manufacturing. Any tips or suggestions on how to, quote, drag institutional knowledge <laughs> from less technical frontline employees? How to drag it. I like that. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is, and we'll get to this in a little bit. So thank you, Ryan, for that question. <clears throat> One of the things is you have to have people who are interested in sharing and you have to have people who are interested in, in listening. So we have people who are happy to share all their stories, but the people listening aren't, aren't ready to receive it yet. So I think identifying who, 
specifically might fit those two roles and then encouraging it and maybe setting up a committee or giving them a, making it, making it seem like, Hey, this is a cool idea. Funding a lunch, um, giving them a task. And, and I'll tell you the secret. If you want something to happen, put it on people's goals. I <laughs> mean, like at the end of the day, um, you want some of the stuff to happen organically and informally, but if it's, if it's on someone's goals, then you know that there is an owner of it. Uh, I also see some of the, the comments that y'all put in there. I love that. I uh, never want to hear the young folks say, hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, that I like, I like that comment. And, and I would say it can kind of go the other way. One of the things that we've gotten feedback from our new employees is when they're new and they're trying to get acclimated to our company, if we say, Hey, we've got a bunch of videos on this. That's not a really, that's, that's a really hard way to learn stuff, especially as when you're new and all of the information is new, the just kind of sitting someone down with the videos is, is that's not, that's probably like the, the last thing on the list to pass down some knowledge. So thank you, Steve, for jumping in there. And Ryan, thank you for that question. Um, okay, so the, the goal with, with explicit, we want to think about how we can develop expe expectations around wh what are we documenting, where is it going to be saved, making sure it's just really clear, and then having the discipline to continue to continue doing that. And then ultimately the goal, it's, it's to turn that tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge if it applies, and then back again. So if, if somebody is... Uh, you have a lead technical professional, a, te a technical expert who is having to continually sit down and say, hey, this is why we do it this way, or we need to follow these steps in order to um, accomplish this task. That should be a red flag that we say, okay, we need to document that. We need to make sure, because this is the fourth time you've had to sit with one of our project managers or one of our engineers in training. Why don't we document this and have that be part of our explicit documented knowledge. And I'll, uh, a quick example of this that I, I think is kind of something, you may have something similar at your organization. We have a, a group manager who felt like he was having to have the same conversation over and over with, a, with um, three to four to five year staff about just kind of like how to uh, certain, piece of projects at the beginning, like just kind of how, how would it get it rolling, how to get it started and, and make sure that they were organized the way that he was expecting as their group manager. And so he has, he set up, he calls it his QC list. So um, before they even, before they get to the part where they're setting stuff up, putting stuff on calendars, coming up with their plan, he has them review their initial plan, like in their head, he has them QC their own work their own plan before they they roll it out to the entire team. And, and I thought that was great. That's just a way that he was, like I said, he's having that conversation over and over again. He's making that now it's part of a, a documented process that they have. Before you do this, go, go answer all of these questions on your own and then move forward. So that was kind of the how you can transferring knowledge through coaching, mentoring, and storytelling. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the what. So the messages, guides, the space, the structure, and the expectations. The messages. We want to take a few minutes. I'll spend a, quite a bit of time on, on this piece. When we're thinking about what we're, what information we're, we're passing along, it's important to think about what kind of messages are we keeping? Who has this knowledge? What questions will you ask? And what kind of messages do you leave behind? Kinds of messages to keep. These are ones about the philosophy, the, why we do what we do. And that's a really, really Im important piece is we want to explain not only what we're doing, but this is important because, and, and because is such the, is a critical word in that, the philosophy there. 
also, especially when we're passing along technical knowledge or technical expertise, you have someone who's been in the industry, been an engineer for for many years. We have um, we have someone who's celebrating their their 40th anniversary here at Freeze and Nichols. They started right out of school, and we're trying to think how do we how do we pass on his his technical approaches because they're so thoughtful, they're so um, they're, they're just really, they're the right approach. He's done it the right way and he has all of this knowledge. And so that's some, one of the things that we want to keep is, is how does he, how does he do that? And I'll tell you one of the things that doesn't work that we'll get to this in a second, but, and, and I'll tell you this because we've tried, Hey, how do you approach projects? <laughs> when we ask him that question, he's like, uh, he just, it's hard for people to articulate what it is that they do when they've been doing it for so long. So we'll get to the kind of questions in a minute, but um, that made me think of him and his technical approaches. The efficiency, if we can be efficient, then those are messages that we want to keep. Uh, if there's like funding or, or regulatory changes, we want to keep those messages and connection to founders and leaders, if that's an important piece of your company or your organization. Stephanie, I'm not sure if you've already addressed this yet or not, but yeah. uh, Lovick uh, Evans just asked a follow-up yeah. and when. So follow-up question mark and when question mark was there? Follow-up. Um, I'm i not, Lovick, if you want to jump back on and say exactly, clarify that question. Okay, okay. thank you. Looks like he did. Yeah. yeah, what I've seen is older engineers can be really <laughs> boring folks. So having this presented to a younger group is really hard for the younger ones to even want to listen. Absolutely. I, I, I don't disagree with you there. Um, although what I've found is there are certain people who are very skilled and and sharing this information. There are certain people who are also interested in learning more. So uh, so the the 40 year guy that I was sharing about earlier, there's one person who uh, is, he, he just looks up to this guy. He thinks he's awesome. He wants to be, he's said on his development plans that he wants to be this guy. He doesn't want to just be an expert in the field. He wants to be in on his development plan. He wants to be this guy. And, and so to me, that's, that's, those natural connections where there is somebody who's interested and there is somebody who is um, interesting, I guess, to, to avoid the boring. Um, and, and so hang on to that thought. We can kind of get into some questions uh, in a little bit, like what, what are some questions you can ask? And I think if you're asking better questions, then it doesn't become a uh, just a stream of consciousness. It doesn't become... A, a boring talk. If you come up with better questions, if you come up with good questions uh, to, to deliberately focus them in on what you want them to share, I think that can help kind of improve um, people wanting to hear it. All right. Uh, thank you, Stephen Lovick, for, um, for clarifying that and, and jumping in with that question. I'll give you one example of the kind of messages we keep. We, I, I, was did this presentation actually with a with a client of ours and he said one of the the messages that they always want to keep in mind is why we do what we do which is interesting because Jim I you just mentioned that so you're you're reading my mind right now in the chat uh, the why is really important why we do what we do and I have a picture of a kid's uh, handprints there. One one story that our that the client shared is, and that they share at their when they have new employees, and they try to tell this story as often as possible because they want the why to be part of it. Uh, the The city they were doing some repairs, and they needed to rip up a sidewalk, and the sidewalk was right in front of a, a lady's house. She was a little bit older. And the, as they were ripping up the sidewalk, the lady was sitting there and she looked really sad. And so the, the crew stopped and they were, they kind of talked to her, they took a break, they talked to her for a second. And she said, well, my, my daughter's handprints are in that sidewalk and she, she died recently. 
And so the crew, I mean, I can't imagine what that scene would have looked like. Um, just having first, then having the, the noticing her and, and having the time to, to just stop and, and check in. So they, what they did was they cut out the handprints out of the sidewalk and they, they gave it to her. They figured out a way to, to get it to her somehow. And they, and like I said, the city, they want that same attitude, that same stopping and seeing people to be part of their culture. And so they, again, they tell this story, not only is it a feel good story, but it also sets the expectation. This isn't just about getting your job done. Your job is to serve our community. And, uh, and, and they could, they could have just said that your job's not your job. Your, your job isn't just to get your tasks done. It's to serve the community. They could have said that. But when it's connected to the story, it's just the, the it's powerful. That's a way that they're transferring the knowledge with of of this and their culture throughout their organization. Okay, I want to take a second and I want you to think about and I want you to, to share with me in the chat how you currently capture knowledge at your organization. Maybe you have a strong or a specific cultural element to your to your company or organization. How do you how do you capture that? What are some things that your company has in place? Technical knowledge, project experience, even where where are things at you know, on the computer, on a shared drive in an old dusty library somewhere? How do you all capture this knowledge for those four questions? And I'll give you a second if, if you Take a, take a second to think about it and start typing those in the chat box. All right, and as as y'all are thinking, I was able to kind of scroll through the comments. A lot of good comments in in there, and an apprenticeship program is a fantastic way to transfer knowledge. Absolutely, Jim, I wanted to read your your full comment too. The the why is important. Simon Sinek's book start with why. Great resource. Absolutely, a huge fan of that one. I think that is a uh, it, it's really good to think about what is your why, but also what are other people, the people that you're interacting with, it kind of helps you, you think about that. What are people's motivations? Thank you. Humor, uh, yeah, sure. Humor is, is a way that you can, um, it, it, it adds an element of people wanting to be there when you can keep it light and keep it fun. I'll share a quick one about our, the way we share our technical knowledge. And, and this is something that we've developed formally over the past couple of years, maybe five years or so. We have a lead technical program. So one of the things that's important to us is that people know that they can, they can grow and develop in a sales role, in a technical role, and in a management role. And that there are there are plenty of opportunities in each. And so, in our technical role, we we want to put leaders in place who their only job is to um, be that the senior technical people on projects to pass down knowledge, to um, and to help kind of get together with other technical people and say how are we at, how are we um, bringing what's out there in the industry and making sure that our folks know about it. So they have, they have had lots of different ideas on how to do it. We've had the library discussion, where do we save all of this stuff? Uh, but one of the things that is on their, their goals is to have um, that, that coaching component. They have to have the coach, they, they have to be coaching, actively seeking out younger people to, to coach. And then they also are having, they're developing a development plan. So when new employees come in, the new employee, employees have a um, technical development plan. 
We also have new employee checklists. We have buddy a buddy system for new employees. That's more maybe on the cultural history, how do you do your timesheet type stuff. But separately, our lead technical professionals are saying, OK, but if we have a stormwater engineer come in, they need to know these three things at this stage, at year one, at year two to three, they need to know these seven things. I'm making up numbers. But um, you know, they, they have a development plan for different levels where people are. And I thought that was a, that was, that's a great idea and also gives new employees something to work towards. All right, I see some some other comments coming in. Mentoring by more experienced team members absolutely is such a such a huge component. And I actually run our mentoring program, and I encourage we have something I call it breakup day every year. I, I don't know if my boss likes that or not, but we um, I encourage people to consider every year is this mentor match serving you? Is it something that you do you want to? swap and get a new mentor because the thing is if you've had a good mentor connection they're going to be your mentor you know for a long time but is it something that you know, hey do you want to go is, does someone else have another skill set that you want to learn under and so i really try to encourage people um, mentoring isn't a marriage so um yes find someone that you connect with and that you can really learn from uh, but once you you've had them for a couple of years are you still getting the same um, are you still growing the way you were a couple of years ago when you started? Oftentimes the answer is, is no. Let's see, formal presentations for an orientation session. Yes, informal charts, chats, charts, <laughs> informal chats. Yes, coffee and donuts, no agenda. Yes, one of our, our CEO, um, the, our former CEO, he has um, roundtable discussions. And the only and he, he he lures us in with with treats and coffee or uh, sodas or whatever. But he he says the the only way that we leave here is uh, after all of you have asked me one question. And so it's kind of fun. It's small groups, um, six to ten people, and those those roundtable discussions. I think Jim, great great example there. That's such an important thing. Um. Let's see, Ashley, we begin recording training sessions so they can be viewed anytime. That's that's great. That's really helpful. And what I found, too, is, uh, again, you, you want to avoid a dumping ground when you record a training session and just put it out there. What I like to do for, for my training is to say, hey, if, if someone missed it, uh, I either like to edit the video or have someone edit the video and, and chunk it because if it's a five minute video, they're more likely to watch it than if it's an hour long training. Or I say, hey, at the five minute mark, we do this. At the at the seven and a half minute mark, there's a there's a discussion about this. And so it kind of point them almost creating bookmarks so that they know where they can go for different information. Uh, let's see, peer partner program. Ryan says that they do a peer partner program. That's cool to guide new hires as well as informal mentoring managed by our engineering group. Yeah, that's great. Having sometimes it, you don't want to, especially if you're new, you don't want to be having to go to your boss for everything. So having a peer partner, that's perfect. Uh, Betty Jean, if you find, if you find a new trick, share it with your coworkers. That's you would think that was that would be obvious, but I love that. It's true. If you find something cool, make sure that you're not keeping it to yourself or assuming that other people already know it. Go go share it with them. Uh, love it. I have a general rule to to what an answer will be. Then have the younger ones solve it more technical. Then we compare the results. Rule of thumb and technical answers are generally close. Yeah, that's great. It's great, and I like that you're letting them solve it and then coming to you to talk about it. So that way they're learning, you're not just telling, so that's perfect. And uh, and the fact that they're close, that makes it kind of fun too. It almost seems like a, like a game. A uh, number of companies I worked for over the years. <laughs> yeah, it's, companies are not perfect, so dysfunctional. And I, I would say most companies, organizations have, have room to grow in this. 
Um, Susan, good to good to hear see your name and uh, hear from you. Coaching and mentoring is one on one. Training and stories geared towards small group. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're you're spot on there. You, I, I've heard of mentoring circles, which are small groups, two to three, with a with a senior person. Uh, but yeah, mentoring small groups, one on one training, storytelling that could be that could be it might be more effective. Yeah, in a in a larger group. Good. Uh, let's see. We also have to try mentors outside an employee outside an employee's chain of command. Yes, that's I, I, Ryan. That's that's something that I encourage too. just it can get a little sticky if you're like complaining to your boss or complaining about your boss to your boss's boss. That's that can be a little tricky. Um, and I like the idea to thinking about outside mentors. Who can you plug people into, you know, through through GSP? Is there a, can you all connect each other with with some younger folks? Not to not to uh, steal other people's employees in the long run, but just to get them exposed to different different people, different ways of thinking. So um, yeah, lots of it sounds like lots of people are doing some really cool stuff around mentoring, coaching. Ashley, the, the training tip is all good. So one of the things we want to think about as far as messages to keep, you got to identify who has that knowledge. Who is it? And, and a really good place to start is to look at the makeup of your company. Who's retiring in less than five years? What about five to 10 years? This isn't perfect because of course somebody could win the lottery tomorrow and leave and, and they may not be in that, in that range, but, this is a good kind of solid place to start is looking at who's retiring. Also, you want to think about who has specialized knowledge, who's the only one that knows how to operate this. We need to make sure that there's redundancy and that they they are identifying people that, that they can kind of bring along there. Um, and then who has, for, for us, client relationships are really important because we want to know who has the client relationships and if they leave, how are we going to maintain that connection? Okay, so I told you that uh, about going to someone who has 40 years experience and saying, okay, we need to capture your, your knowledge. We need to be able to pass down your knowledge. How do you... How do you approach a project or what's what's the most important thing you've you've learned these questions can't they're so big if you put someone on the spot like that it's it may, it's probably not going to turn out the way you want it's not going to be this really meaningful passing down of knowledge so I want you to think about and go. Y'all can go ahead and, and type in the chat. What are some questions that you you would ask if you were sitting with someone? You know, they they're set to retire next year. What are some questions you could ask them to try to capture this knowledge? To to try to figure out what's in their head and how you can make sure that that's passed down in the company. <clears throat> I'll give you just a minute and then I'll share. I've got I've got three just kind of for you to consider as well. <laughs> Betty Jean, you had someone who <laughs> white won quite a bit of money in a radio contest that she ended up staying. That's that's commitment. I like it. All right. Well, for time's sake, we're going to keep moving, but please do continue to, to type in questions that you think might be effective because I hope what I hope is when you leave, you can go put some of these questions into, into play in, in your organization, your company. So instead of, you know, how does this work or what was the most important thing you learned? Think about how did you think more specific? When you were working on this, how did you figure out how to do blah, 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 something specific on, on this project? Why did we do it this way? When we were going through our leadership transition, why did we do the, it this way? I think that that question is probably one of my favorite questions. Why did we do it this way? And not in a, um, 
not in a judgmental way. I guess you have to you have to be careful about how you say the why, but um, but just kind of exploring an exploratory why. And then again, when when was the time that you blah blah blah? What was the biggest mistake you ever made, and how did you resolve it? I like that. Uh, for sometimes questions like that, if you give people a little bit more time to think about it, I think that that can also be a really helpful helpful thing. When we have um, fireside chats or when we used to do that with with Bob Nichols and Jim Nichols, we would give them a list of questions and they would select the ones that they wanted to answer. And then we would we, they would have their little fireside chats where they would talk about talk about that. <laughs> do I get your parking spot? Yes, that's a fantastic question. You might get some bonus points for that. All right, things you don't want to ask. Again, questions you want to ask, you, you want to think about um, like a specific project or a problem that they you saw them work through or that, um, you know, even something like like based on the time that we were in um, before the internet, <laughs> if, if uh, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, how did you know? But just thinking about like different obstacles they had to face and different obstacles they conquered and, and getting really specific about that. The questions you don't want to ask are the really big questions that like, tell me everything you know, or that, that kind of stuff is, is overwhelming to people. And then hypothetical questions, it's not that they're bad, they, there are just better questions that can lead to stories that, that can really capture that knowledge. <clears throat> and then you wanna also think about the messages you leave behind. And, and there's a, a podcast called Story Brand by Donald Miller. And in that he talks about bowling balls and and when you, he's coming at it from like a marketing perspective, but I like it when we're talking about storytelling and, and just coaching people, mentoring anything. When you tell people something, imagine them holding a, a bowling ball for every fact that you give them. And if you can picture them holding a bowling ball, then you'll know you, there's only a couple bowling balls you can hold in your hand before you start losing toes and, and dropping the bowling balls and creating holes in the ground. So when you want to pass pass on along knowledge, you want to make sure that you're, what you're passing along are the, the, the major points. You don't want to give any bowling ball that's just going to be distraction or, or not helpful information or doesn't align with what you want it to. I'll give you a quick example. <clears throat> if, if I were to tell you about Frieza Nichols University, which is what I, I work in our our organizational development department. And under that, we have a little internal university. So if I were to tell you about it, and I, I were to start with, well, Freeze and Nichols University, it was started by a, a man named Jim Cross in, 19, in the 1990s, and we offer X many classes. If I'm trying to pass down knowledge to you, that's not, those are, those are non-important bowling balls. <laughs> The, the date, unless you know Jim Cross, he's a fantastic, he's, he's fabulous. But unless you know him, even his name is not going to be important or stick with you. So instead, I might want to say how, when I'm passing down knowledge, I might want to share a story about how we had a big aha moment with Friesen Nichols University or how we shifted in, when this um, year uh, this this one year in 2020 when this pandemic came out and we had to transfer all of our training online and there there's, could be a story there about about um, <clears throat> how the training now looks like um, because of something a, a critical time in history that caused it to shift. Okay, so remember bowling balls. You don't want to give people too many to hold on to. You want to focus in on the main information. Uh, Non-values aligned information, I'll a quick story about that or a quick example of what that might be. Uh, let's say your company talks about work-life balance and that you value employees and you want to make sure that they are that they are spending time with their families and also spending time at work, getting it done. Uh, if you tell stories about a guy who got a bonus or um, a lady who got a bonus because they stayed up all night working on a project, that's those two messages are in conflict. 
the, the working all night and work-life balance. So you want to be careful that you're not contradicting the values that you're actually, you, you, that are important to your organization. And then, and then, like I mentioned, the non-essential information. All right, Stephanie, Steve, what question do you have? Questions. Yeah, yeah. Got perfect timing. Uh, Abe says, what is the best and worst situation you came across? That, oh, fantastic. That would be a great question to ask. Um, I'm assuming that that's a, in response to um, what kind of questions can you ask people? And that's, that is a really good one because people can usually think about the, the best and, and probably worst. I would, I'd be curious, Abe, go ask people that question. I would be curious to see what they start with. I would guess worse, but um, <laughs> th sometimes those can be memorable. It's, it's the mistake. It's how we learn from mistakes. Good. What else do we have, Steve? So uh, Betty Jean relays from Susan Sprague again, do firms need a budget for informal coaching slash mentoring slash storytelling to ensure or encourage knowledge gets passed along? Right. Yes. Thank, thank you, Susan. I would say if they don't know, you don't need one, but if it's going to be, um, if people are really going to adopt this mindset of, of doing that, I think that it helps. And I don't, I wouldn't say it has to be a big, maybe it's buying lunch for everyone or buying coffee and donuts, like someone mentioned earlier, and just saying, hey, we're going to have a little fireside chat, we're going to, we're going to have some of our folks just kind of come and share. And that's, that's an easy way for us. I'll tell you, mentoring, a lot of times that that revolves around lunch, but that's not funded by the company. So we have a mentor and a mentee who are meeting and they go out to lunch. They they figure out how how to pay for it um, on their own. It's not something funded. But I do think it, it would be wise to budget time for that technical coaching. I think that's important. Um, and then also having I mentioned this earlier, but having people who have it on their goals. So in a way, funding that um, if you have it on your goals and, and putting time to that, then yes, I think that will take up some, some time and, and money. Yeah, that seemed to be the last of the questions directly for you. Of course, there's a few other uh, questions in the form of comments that you would ask Great. previously. So. Yeah, awesome. Keep them coming. I think that's fantastic. Uh, and one thing, and this goes to... I think this goes to one of the comments earlier about sometimes stuff is boring. Um, sometimes when, when people are sharing, it's not catching the attention of the people it needs to. And I, one of the things that we want to avoid is, is the advice trap. There's something called the advice, uh, the advice monster that can, that lurks inside all of us. And when someone shares a problem they have, it's like, okay, we have in, in about 10 seconds, I have 25 answers to, to your problem right here. Just listen to me and all my fabulous advice. The problem with with that is and what we want to avoid if you are the storyteller, if you are somebody who is is charged with passing on knowledge. We want to make sure that we're, we're not letting that advice monster get in the way, because we may not know if we're solving the right problem, if we are, if our advice is as good as we think it is, or if we are in our form of we think it's coaching or um, we, we were hoping it's coaching that we're somehow taking away the person's ability to solve the issue. And someone mentioned that earlier about how how he has his rules of thumb and then the, the younger engineer, they go solve the problem. I think that's great because in, when you're doing that, you're not taking away from the person's ability to solve the issue themselves. And I think it, the the other part of the advice monster. So if you can conquer the advice monster, then you can share stories that are relevant to the people and that are important to the the people listening. And that's the most important thing. And the guides. These are. This is the next part of of um, what we're what we're passing along and how we're doing it. There, it, it could be. It could be anyone in your company. Certainly senior leaders should be passing along information. Managers are, are tasked with passing along the right information. Um, influencers, I'm not talking about people who have a lot of Instagram followers, but people who they may not have the authority, but you 
there are people that as you're walking through the organization, you know that they have influence just to, because of how they connect with people. Guides can also be momentum builders. So, so these people um, can, can get people similar to influencers. They can get people behind them and, and get started on something. Maybe they just have that achievement drive where they just want to get stuff done. Support teams can also be crucial to passing on knowledge. A lot of times they, they know where, where everything is saved, where everything is stored. And so they can come up with creative solutions. And then the next generation thinking about how they can be part of listening, but also taking an active role to document things and pass along, pass along their knowledge. Even if they've only been here five years, they have knowledge that they can be passing along and growing up the, the people behind them. Some skills for guides. Um, so when you're thinking about who might be a guide in my organization, people that just have an ear for stories, or are interested in the past. Those, those people who like context, do they, that's important to them. If you can identify who those are, then you can say, but this might be a good guide. They might be able to capture that story, but then also share it in their meetings, on their project teams, in their trainings and things like that. People who have relationships, good internal relationships, that's, that's important. Uh, knowledge of policies, or politics in order to shape policy. This one was specific with, with um, the, uh, the client that I did this presentation with, that he said in, in his organization, that is really, really important that you know how politics work because you need to know how to get things done. People who are organized, that's, that's always helpful, detail oriented and then process driven. Uh, but guides don't have to have all of these things, but when you're looking at these bullets, you might want to, they can kind of help you pick out who might be a good person for this. And then space. I talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, I've heard the term accidental collisions when you're in the break room and you're filling up your coffee and someone else is in there and, and you just start catching up and like, Hey, what are you working on these days? And and trying to to maximize um, it, without even without intentionally doing it, you, you're maximizing that time just being together, sharing a story, and then moving on. So when you're thinking about your your space, do you have physical spaces to gather? Do you take breaks in the day? I'm I'm guilty of eating lunch at my desk um, often, but when I when I'm able to take a break or when I'm able to grab lunch, we have a we have tables in our break room. So sometimes I'll go eat in there and, and just it's it's it is really fun when the people stop by because if you're in the break room, it's small enough as someone else walks in, they kind of have to talk to me. So um, it, it is kind of it's good to get together and be with people that way. And then, of course, there's formal spaces, meetings and trainings. And then if you're a manager, if you're someone who has lots of meetings on your calendar, do you have white space on your calendar? Like chunks of time that people can come by, swing by and and have time with you, even if it's quick. But it's important that if you are one of those people who has who has those stacked meetings that you also make sure people know how and when they can they can connect with you. Office hours. Office hours. Yeah, absolutely. And then this is one of the things that we're working on now. How do you simulate an open door policy? or accidental collision in a virtual environment. It's, it's tricky. I'll, I'll share one example. I actually got an email last night from uh, one, of our, one of our ladies in Houston, and she said that what they're going to do is they're going to start something, a meeting in Teams that they call Kitchen. <laughs> they, they've named it Kitchen. And whenever they start the meeting, if, if you're not familiar with Teams, if you start a meeting, um, if you're in my meeting, you'll get a notification if I start it. So it will say Stephanie has started the meeting or someone has started the meeting. So their idea is 10 minutes a day, they're going to start their kitchen meeting. And then whoever's available at the time will just jump in and they'll, they'll just chat. And it's informal, unstructured time. It has a time limit, only 10 minutes. And then they're going to go back on their way. So 
I thought that that's cool. And, and I don't know if it will work or not, but the fact that her and a couple other people that she copied on the email were excited about it. That's, that's what matters. I mean, that's, they're going to get some, they're going to get value out of it. All right. And then the structure, we've talked about this a little bit, um, but, but it needs to be easy and accessible. It's uh, I, again, here's another photo box. I, I'm terrible with, with photo, with printed photos. They are everywhere. They're in boxes everywhere. And it's not easy. It's not accessible. I had to get a, a baby photo of me the other day for a, a game we were doing in, in a virtual meeting. And I had to go, I, I had like five different photo albums trying to find like, which, which is the baby photo era? When, when was it when I was young? And they're all mixed. It's just, it's not a good situation. So, um, but the same thing happens with our with our valuable information for a company or for for your organization. It's important that when we're we're storing information, it's easy, it's accessible. So, um, do people know how to get to it? Is it something that they can read? Are they going to read a hundred page document, or can that be? Could there be a summary at the at the beginning of the document? Um, do all the process, uh, every documented process, does it live in the same spot? And for one group, is it the same if that person, it, it, from another group? We've had people who were really familiar with the way their group worked and then they switch groups. And now this group does it totally different. And that's okay, but um, there, may be, there may be a better way to do it. And that's something for your organization to consider. Stephanie, Steve, this is yeah. not so much a comment, but a, I mean, a question, but a comment. Yeah. But I thought you might want to address it. Uh, Lovick basically says the way you do stuff is different for a small and a large company. Large company ways don't work well with a small company. So I thought that yes. might have been something you'd have to talk about. Yeah. And great, great point. You certainly have to be aware of what works for the size of your company and the way that people do things. So and um, that that is a really great point. Uh, small companies not as structured as large companies. You're right, and it's probably easier to get in contact with people. It, it may be, it, it it doesn't have to be as um, like you said structured if you want to get a hold of somebody. Uh, but it still is important that there is a whatever size your company is. It's important that you that there are some expectations, which is going to be my next point. Some expectations around what this looks like and passing along knowledge. All right, so with structure, creating storage structure, clear naming convention, and again, no, no dumping of information. All right, so this is our, our last piece of, of this, and this is about expectations. Whatever size your company is, you're, if you're in an organization that this is important to pass along this knowledge, we want some expectations, bettering yourself to be better. Uh, are you wanting to help yourself? Are you wanting to help the organization? Um, in order to do that, you need to be thinking about how you can be, uh, for example, process. If you're going to document a process. Yeah, it may be the company policy, but it's also going to make you better. And so if people have this mindset, it will, it will go a long way. Ride-alongs. Uh, this is something that I've one of our managers has shared with me that this is something that they expect with their senior staff is if they're driving somewhere they and uh, they've got a younger person going with them they don't take two separate cars they take they take one car and then he encourages them while they're in the car don't talk about the weather don't talk about football I mean you can but just for a little while and, but then move on and try to talk about more meaningful things because that is such a uh, you have them hostage for a while as you're driving to your site to share this knowledge, to have them ask you questions, for you to ask them questions and to really make sure that they're capturing that time. Um, expectations around formal trainings and meetings, how you're going to be intentional about passing along knowledge during those times. Um, one of our groups, another thing that they do is for every meeting that they have or for every their big quarterly meetings, they make sure that there is a lessons learned uh, on the agenda. And that's something y'all may do too. Maybe that's every meeting for you, but they have a, a set time where they're expecting to pass along lessons learned from projects. 
Um, and then the intentional form, informal time, like we mentioned around um, making sure that we're connecting with people informally. All right, and finally, these are the takeaways. Um, I've enjoyed our time together. I'm looking forward to reading through the comments again after this is over, but start now. If you're interested in passing down knowledge, start now. Uh, think about some of the things we talked about, about how you can do it, about some of the, the tips that you've heard and how you might be able to, to transfer that back and, and apply it to your organization. Think about what you have, what knowledge you have. Um, maybe you are, you are someone who has specialized knowledge um, and you can be do a better job about sitting down and, and passing that along. Uh, begin training to be a guide. So if you are someone who can capture those stories um, or you're someone who wants to grow and, and, and develop that technical expertise or become a leader in the company, think about how you can start capturing those stories. Get a mentor, get, get several mentors, um, set up time with coaches, and then start sharing the stories that you hear in your organization. And finally, uh, be intentional. This doesn't just happen. You don't just... Passing down knowledge, it does just happen, but if you want to be to be better at it, to be good and, and pass down the right information, we need to have some intentionality as we are as we are doing it. And with that, I think Steve has put out a, que uh, a request. If there are any other questions, I think we ha have a couple minutes if, if there's anything else. Or I'm, I'm so happy to visit with you if you ever have any um, questions or thoughts or want to talk through this a little bit more, always happy to visit. All right. We'll give them just another second uh, or two and see if anybody has any other questions. But uh, while we're waiting on that, uh, I just want to remind everybody, too, um, that uh, if, if you'd like to see uh, a lot of the content that we at GSPE have to share, a lot of professional development hours and so on throughout time, feel free to subscribe and uh, click that notification icon and, and you'll get notified when something new pops in. So, uh, and no, nothing else yet. But, uh, and also, Stephanie, of course, I'd like to thank you uh, for doing this for us. This has been a great presentation. I think everybody enjoyed it from seeing some of the content uh, or the comments rather. So, uh, Thank you very much for doing this with us. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. It was, it was great visiting with all of you. All right. Let's give everybody just another couple seconds. And if not, I think we'll, uh, we'll let you go and get on with the rest of your day. Okay. Good comment, Steve. Yes. Oh, uh, somebody's asking about subscribe to what? To the YouTube channel. Uh, so it's youtube.com slash G-S-P-E-N-G. So Georgia Society of Professional and then kind of the short abbreviation for engineers. G-S-P-E-N-G. All right. Well, I think that's it, Stephanie. Thanks, and uh, we'll let you get on with your day. Okay, great. All Thanks, right. everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.